that might yeah, shut off. Just, just, just give it back to me because I love it. <laughs> How long are we here for an hour? Or? Yeah, an hour and a half. It's, it's kind of a weird amount, amount of time. time. script. Like, yeah. good to go, right? Yeah. We, uh, what's, uh, are you going to go down the line? Or are we going to do a jump ball? Or how yeah. to start it off? How are you going to do it? I'm going to I'm going to talk about the topic for a minute, and then I'm going to uh, allow you guys to introduce yourselves. Okay. Hey, so uh, thanks for having us. Um, really excited to be here. I'm Steve Masur. I am a partner at Cowan Debates Abrahams and Shepherd, which is a entertainment law firm in New York. I have a kind of an interesting role there, though. I'm a uh, I'm I'm a principal at their venture law group. So what I do is venture capital work, um, and I work with a lot of companies that are in the digital media space. I've been doing it for about 20 years, so I've gotten to do a lot of deals with your YouTubes and your Facebooks and, and you know a lot of the OTT networks. And um, so what the panel's about really is that, is about uh, cross-platform and celebrity engagement. And it's a, it's a topic that I personally am very interested in because it's uh, kind of to me, if you, if you think about what is the disconnect between the tech industry that I know and love and the entertainment industry that everybody here knows and loves, um, it's, it's one of the, the big things I've noticed is a disconnect is sort of in the tech industry, there's this feeling that the product is the product and that's good enough. You know, like we built Amazon, so come to Amazon and that's good enough. But in the entertainment business, we all understand that you, you kind of need to draw a connection between uh, celebrity. Like you're never gonna get your movie sold if there isn't somebody good attached. Um, and I think right now is a really exciting time because the, uh, the sort of celebrity engagement and um, brand engagement, um, so both the business models and the money and also the things that make entertainment products compelling for people are sort of coming to the tech business and the tech business is coming to the entertainment business. So that's, that's really what the panel's about. Like if you read the panel description, it's a little confusing, but I figured I would describe it that way. Um, and uh, so with that, I would love to hear more from the panelists about who they are and what they do. Um, and I'll start with Justin Hochberg. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, how are you? Um, I like that. Who said that right there? Front row. There we go. Always, always stack the audience in your favor. Get the good laughers in the audience when you tell a joke, right? There, okay. <laughs> there we go. That'll be the highlight of my introduction. Um, so my name's Justin Hochberg, and I run my own production company that is part of the Endemol Shine uh, conglomerate. Um, and I will say that you probably read the trades and know what Endemol Shine is, and what, and I will. I would like to correct uh, pretty much all of you, um, <laughs> simply because Endemol Shine talks about uh, you know a giant company, many formats, scripted, international, etc. It is the standard story of consolidation in any industry, and I think they're wrong. And I think what they do that's different than most every other company in their sector is they look at the world from not just making hit content, whether it's scripted, unscripted, digital, through our MCN, and all beyond, but businesses. And if you think about in the entertainment industry, the one company that comes to mind that does this, it's Disney, right? It's Frozen movie, it's Frozen lunchboxes, it's Frozen rides. Endemol's conglomerate is really focused on the taking, sort of dropping of one idea into a pond and watching the ripple effects across all of its assets and building businesses. And what most people don't know is that we do that in 179 different territories with not only signing personalities like Michelle Fawn and Pitbull and Steve Harvey, but a variety of other pieces of talent, whether it's digital, scripted, or reality. And uh, our, so our business model largely is the creation of businesses off of content in as many possible ways, which today with shrinking margins and networks and distribution portals beating you up seems to be uh, a, either at least seemingly smart and certainly um, gives us a lot of leverage in the marketplace. And that's what we do. And that's what I hope to talk about today and, and how perhaps that can be of use to you guys. Well, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Bill Sanders. I am, um, I run a, 
relatively new division uh, at PMKBNC, uh, which is a well-known PR firm, marketing communications firm that represents celebrity talent as well as uh, consumer brands. And, and the division that I oversee is called personal brand management, which was an acknowledgement by the company that uh, the lines uh, between celebrity and brands and uh, social media platforms, et cetera, are all blurring. And so the role of the traditional publicist has morphed great, uh, a great deal. And they, uh, the company decided that it might be useful to have someone in-house that could not only um, work with the publicists uh, that the talent hires, but help them monetize and build their personal brands, uh, their lifestyle brands, if you will. And most of the clients I work with are not actors, although I have some clients that are actors. I work with Terry Hatcher from Desperate Housewives, Dave Bautista from Guardians of the Galaxy. But for the most part, the goal was to acknowledge that in, in our current environment that celebrity means something a lot different than it used to, and that a lot of people that have robust personal lifestyle brands can create long-term businesses. I came from the world of sports, where people have been doing that for a long time. I was a brand manager for Yao Ming and Steve Nash and Carmelo Anthony, a lot of NBA players. Um, and as the money from brands started to diversify, and not only were brands hiring athletes, they were also now hiring chefs and actors and musicians and do-it-yourselfers, et cetera, um, I felt like I needed to be in a place where um, I could be a career agnostic and work with celebrity, the term used loosely, of lots of different walks of life. So my, my role is to help connect celebrity with their fans and then monetize that connection through traditional endorsement deals and also new opportunities like branded entertainment. Hi, my name is Sarah Cummings. I work at Microsoft on their advertising solutions team. And what that really means is so much bigger than it sounds. It's actually connecting content and celebrities in a unique environment, leveraging dynamic technology like Xbox, Skype, uh, HoloLens is most recently introduced but also creating an experience that we could be monetized through an advertiser or even aligned to a brand that's in-house like a Halo or Surface. So our responsibility is really to think outside of the box on how we can create experiences that really connect the celebrities or content to key demographics and fan bases that then can be leveraged further through advertisers or even our own internal brands. Thank you. I'm Evan Soroka from Creative Artists Agency, and I help lead a team called uh, Corporate Finance, which is a horrible and non-informative name. Um, but what we what we really do is essentially uh, business development and strategy work, both for the agency in thinking as a principal, as well as for our our biggest clients, and helping both of those uh, entities. Uh, figure out how to both grow and diversify, and many of the examples um, listed previously uh, are similar um, to things uh, that we do as well. In the case of sort of working with Pitbull, uh, helping him think through his end of all deal and what that means for his business and how he can expand it, uh, and doing that across all aspects of our work, ranging from film, television, music, video games, uh, sponsorships, licensing, live events, etc. Hi, my name is Scott Manson. I uh, help run a company called SB Projects. We're probably most famous uh, for our founder, Scooter Braun, uh, discovering Justin Bieber on YouTube. We manage Justin, 17 other acts, including Ariana Grande, Cy, Carly Rae Jepsen, have uh, interest in six of the other biggest management companies in the music space. In the last three years, we've diversified a bit, uh, have Scorpion, one of the biggest shows on CBS right now, hold tech investments in Uber and Spotify and a bunch of other uh, interesting companies from the Valley that we see uh, early. And, you know, we started in the talent management space and as the industry evolved and as we were building these brands, we realized that we needed to have best in class partners and relationships across the board in a lot of uh, these different areas. and. Um, we're, we're trying to figure out what that next big thing is that we're going to do. And it's really fun now because it could be an act that we find tomorrow on YouTube that we push immediately, or it could be a TV show that we're pitching together. Uh, so it's a really exciting time and happy to be here. Uh, Rob Lee and my company is Bayonne Entertainment. And uh, for the most part, 
I have to wake up every morning and think of a, a new idea or see something, whether it's on the web or even in the old-fashioned newspaper, and say, that's a show, and then figure out you know, who I'm going to put into it. Or, you know, and, and celebrity means so much, although the definition these days, uh, you know, recently it's, it's not who's had the hit show on your normal cable or broadcast network, but who has you know, the most followers, uh, you know, on, on the web and on Instagram and, you know, on their Facebook, et cetera. And it's a whole new world in how you are packaging, you know, television shows, which I did when I was an agent, you know, 20 years ago. Um, uh, from my standpoint, the, the digital platforms versus the traditional platforms, uh, I'm still very much going on the traditional side because that's the cornerstone financing at least you know as to five minutes ago but it's changing wherever I can get the most money to get something going is where I'm going first so and so how is it mo how is it what how does the money work um, like if you were to put percentages on it and I'd, I'd love to hear you know anyone sure. else on the panel as well but um, how much is TV driving it versus you know, internet versus mobile, and where is that going? How is that going to develop, and, and what, what evidence have you seen for how that's developing? I, I'll just, uh, I'll quickly comment on that and let everybody else, uh, you know, chime in, because, and this is different, this is getting a project going, talent can be involved, and that helps talent as opposed to a talent marketing him or herself. Right. Um, and for the most part, it's, you, probably try to get 100% still in a traditional marketplace, but then what is that marketplace? I, you know, today I, I actually called up Awesomeness Television on a, a variation of my uh, America's Best Dance Crew show, which is coming back to MTV. I have a different version with younger talent, and I'm saying if I go to them and partner I think YouTube is ready to do, you know, a full-fledged television show and can actually finance the several hundreds of thousands of dollars for that show to be produced. And with awesomeness, I'll probably be, they, they will have the ability to bring in uh, the advertising revenue sponsors and the multi-platform uh, uh, situation that's going to be necessary to, to make that really work. Uh, a little bit more difficult than if I went to MTV and sold the show uh, or ABC Family or whatever, but it's actually becoming doable. And if it's a little difficult today, it's going to be less difficult on those platforms tomorrow. So you have to be a lot more creative. I mean, or you are being a lot more creative, I should say. It's, you know, something you, you have to be. I mean, there, there are so many buyers, and so everything's being fractionalized. So, and there's a downward pressure on, in terms of on budgets, but still everybody needs their signature breakout show. And if you're going to launch a platform, I don't care what it is, you better be well enough financed to do some great original programming or you're never going to break out. I'd put it this way. Uh, traditional media has it incredibly easy because you only have to do a small slice of the process, right? If you are a creator of a show like Rob or myself or whomever in traditional, you create the show and you get someone else to fund it, someone else to market it, someone else to advertise it, someone else to manage every aspect except for just creation of the show. In sort of the digital ecosystem, um, entrepreneurs are doing every aspect of it, right? That's how all the YouTube stars started. They did absolutely every aspect of it, including attracting sponsors, brands, et cetera. So, um, the model is very, you know, the great thing about the digital age is it leans towards the entrepreneur who can control his or her fate in a way that, you know, in the traditional media you can't because you're, you've got these giant conglomerates in your way. I mean, the, the, so when you talked about launching a platform, you, you think of it that way, like you think of it in terms of what's going to be compelling on this platform. You're talking well, to me? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, I, you know, in, well, launching a platform, I'm just saying if, Cause, cause if, I, well, if, if guess, a channel, what, whatever it is, yeah. whatever your brand is, and, all, and, and the great thing is uh, digitally you have access. You can get out there, but who's watching? How do you get the eyeballs? Then how do you monetize it? And, and it has to do even, uh, same thing, look at the small cable channels. I mean, are they going to have carriage a couple of years from now? Are they going to disappear? They're cannibalizing each other. 
and and uh, and you're seeing you know ratings go down. So you need to have people, you know, watch and. You may have a good message. You may have a little library of things you can pick up, uh, but you have to have something that puts you on the map. Uh, and, I, and if you look at a lot of these uh, smaller platforms, whether it's digitally or even on the cable side, and I, and I, I, I hear them, gee, we love that idea. That is really groundbreaking, but you know, just, it's, it, you know, we, we don't have the money. We don't have the original programming budget, and, and they're never going to succeed. Uh, and that doesn't mean that money determines everything, because inexpensive shows have broken out, but it, it certainly helps and ultimately will make the difference. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I, I agree with what you were saying about the, uh, you know, having it easy. Um, on the other hand, there's room, you know what I mean, for different kinds of ideas about what, what's going to happen. And I also think that there's uh, sort of a chaos element to it right now where um, whereas previously you had a value chain and you fed into the value chain and it was pretty baked how things would work and people knew each other and there was, a, there was an old boy network, an old girl network in some cases for getting things done. Um, but now you have sort of outliers that just kind of blow up. You have YouTube stars, you have House of Cards which is a piece of original programming with a giant budget that happened completely outside of TV, um, you know, and, and these these examples sort of, they, what they do is they give me hope for independent producers with interesting ideas who are creative and, and want to do something new and different, you know, because it, you also have this uh, new population of people, the biggest population of people who ever walked the face of the earth coming up that that see things differently than we than we do than, than I do. Let's put it. I'll just put myself in the age group. <laughs> no, I would add that that if, you know my perspective is from the talent perspective, and and it's I always love coming to these things and hearing from the production side because they're still the ones that are making the big calls, right? If you're representing talent, you're still pitching somebody who can say yes or no and find the budget to support the project. But what I love about it is that uh, it's a very entrepreneurial environment, in my opinion, especially from the talent's perspective. Because 10, 15 years ago, it was it was the, the the relationship between talent and representative was go get me a gig, show me the money. You know, there was no joke in that. Like that really was the pressure. And now I find I have a couple of clients. You know, one of them is uh, is a she's in the fitness world and she's a trainer for Kelly Ripa and Sarah Jessica Parker, et cetera. And the other one is a is an osteopath who, who is uh, Katy Perry's wellness person. And I work with these people almost as a business advisor, saying to them, as an entrepreneurial partner, identify who your audience is, build a content production schedule that builds that audience. As your social media audience grows, I can go to brands who will then get behind you and put you in some of their content that will help grow your audience. And then eventually we can become much more interesting to folks like fellow panelists who may say, like, she'd be great for my show. But I feel like I have much more influence in the process than just hoping for the best or just saying, like, I can't sign a talent unless they are already monetizable from day one. I can be a little bit visionary and say, I think that person's on a trajectory. If they become my business partner and follow some of my lead, I think we can grow their audience and make them marketable. I didn't have that kind of uh, ability 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Listen, I, I want to make sure you don't get too visionary, though, just a little bit, right? <laughs> I'm not that visionary. Okay, just, <laughs> I'm just trying to take advantage of the system. <laughs> So, uh, Sarah, what, um, I mean, what's interesting to me is how do you decide who works for Microsoft? You know what I mean? Like, like who has enough, uh, what are you looking for? Um, because it's an interesting uh, kind of brand building problem that you have at Microsoft, it seems to me. <laughs> like, you don't find a sports star necessarily, but maybe you do, you know, like Nike does. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on what the overall objective is. One example I was just thinking about is traditional TV and television in general um, have a really amazing opportunity to connect digital with traditional TV. So one example is for Skype, really getting expanding our user base and getting people familiar with what Skype is and what they have to offer from a communication standpoint. But also, when we went to Jimmy Kimmel, we wanted to create an experience that could expand not only 
Jimmy's reach, but also Skype's reach. So we kind of married the two in a way where we leveraged Taylor Swift to come in and extend an invitation to her fan base to send her video messages to create this kind of digital Q&A that would live on Skype, but then would also be showcased on Jimmy Kimmel live and gave an uh, actual fan an opportunity to talk with her live on Jimmy Kimmel. So to me, it was a perfect partnership. It was the right message. It was the right opportunity. It created value for the talent and also Jimmy and also the fan base. So when you ask that question, it's kind of hard to answer because it really just depends on what we're trying to achieve. We've done some original content with Toyota on Xbox and Action Sports, leveraging really unique um, athletes that are innovating in that space and creating technology that can assist them in whatever sport. Yeah, I saw what you were doing with the snowboarders. Yeah. Is that, what you, is that yeah. one of the things you're familiar with that? Yep. I mean, to, to what, what, one of the things they did is to create this opportunity for uh, normal people to talk to these pro snowboarders mm -hmm. on Skype. And the snowboarders actually kind of ran with it, and they, yeah. and they did a bunch of interesting stuff. For yeah, them. they had GoPros on their boards, and it was really interactive, and it allowed us to create content that was unique to the platform, but also create that, I would say, relationship between the user and also the athlete. And for you, it's just a brand branding opportunity, right? I mean, it, or is it more? I mean, are you going to make money with the content you created? I mean, yeah, we could use the content to then, you know, leverage the right brand to, if they want to reach the action, action sports audience like Toyota wanted to, it's a great opportunity for them to take advantage, and it's the right content that people want to share right. and to be a part of. So in, in my limited role as an artist representative, which, I've, which I do for a few people, um, what I've found, they, they do come to me with the digital media stuff. That's what I'm known for. Um, and what I've found is it's very difficult to explain to the artist, sort of to your point before about show me the money, uh, even what they're supposed to do, um, why it's good for them, and why they don't have to get a big advance up front. Um, and <laughs> so I'd love to hear more about that, because I think a lot of artists are sort of uh, like, you know, I, I spoke with uh, Damon Wayans about this, and he said, you know, I'm just going to sit this inning out. I think there's too much crazy stuff going on. I don't know what it is. I don't know why it helps me, so I'm just not going to participate in it right now. And I think there's a lot of artists who are thinking Maybe that Maybe you have that luxury if you're Damon Wayans, right. but, I mean, I have clients that are not Damon Wayans, and they don't have that luxury. Right. It, it's, it is moving so fast. I'm afraid of clients who are sitting out even for a few months that, that just you're missing an opportunity because... As someone said earlier, if you're up for a gig, I, one of the first questions that comes up inevitably is how big is their social media reach? What are they doing digitally? You can't afford to sit out of your talent. The problem is no network or no distribution platform, no matter if digital or traditional, has enough money to market the way they want, right? So, so they are looking to outsource that element. And, and if you walk in with 20 million subscribers, they think, bingo, you know, this is going to really move the needle for us. So 20 million subscribers equals money. How? It depends what we're talking about. I mean, if you're talking about someone in the traditional media, then you're talking about basically a platform to for free advertising, right? So if you think of a network budget or a movie budget, they've got X millions of dollars, and, you know, they'll probably get more play from 20 million dedicated subscribers who have already said, I like the weigh-ins, than they will from, you know, billboard ads. So that's money there. So it's, it's interesting to me, like, how do the brands see this? You know, um, you, you have, like, I have a lot of Twitter followers. I don't tweet very often. I'm not paying attention to it um, a lot, you know, for compared to a normal person. I don't have thousands. I, I, I probably have a thousand, right? <laughs> Um, so it went from a lot to a thousand. Well, <laughs> that doesn't do sound. I lot? don't know that you're going to get representation off this panel, but uh, that's a good pitch nonetheless. <laughs> if this was Shark Tank, you'd be in trouble. Yeah, that, that <laughs> it went from here a lot. Uh, I'm uh, out. So, yeah, your question was. Well, the question is about the brands and how they see this. Um, like, uh, how does the brand equate that to money? Like, like what's the, the you know. And also about how specious the number is. Everyone, everyone beats up Nielsen and says, you know, I don't think this is really TV. They just make up this number and we all believe it because we need a standard. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, and I don't know that digital is that much better. You, you've got all these viewers on digital that nobody knows how many there are, right? 
Um, how many are watching House of Cards on the iPad? Nobody knows. I don't know why they don't know. There's well, an IP hold address, on. Who, who, what do you mean nobody knows? No, Netflix knows. Netflix, and that's the only person that, you know, if you had to reinvent TV, why would you open yourself up to ratings? I mean, if you didn't have to tell anyone, you know, you wouldn't do it because you're there sitting every day waiting to see your metric, right? And Netflix not even trying to sell ads, though. That's right. That's why they don't have to, that's do, why they don't have to do ratings. But, you know, HBO doesn't have to sell ads, and they mistakenly tried to create legitimacy when they launched by saying, look, it's TV, but a different way of TV. But today you don't have to do that, and you can splice data the way they want. So they know exactly. But by the way, they released ratings on Daredevil today. Right? So for the first time ever, they're releasing viewer, some level of viewership. But I wouldn't release ratings if I didn't have to. I mean, who knows? I, I don't know what the other... I think it was a third party that released it. Right, uh, but it's the first but yeah, time but any first insight... Time. It I mean, was based on a case study of 2,500 users that right. they... And interview. some people say they can track users and viewers based on ISP data and peak usage, right? So there's a lot of people trying to figure out how to re-engineer or backwards engineer a Netflix viewership profile. But, you know, if you don't have to do it, then why would you? And, I mean, I'm, and I'm still thinking about it from the artist's perspective, you know. So, Evan, w when you're advising an artist on how they should think about, you know, how much money they're making off of this or that, you know, how do you... How do you do that? Like, how do you think about uh, the different mix that, like, an artist that is huge on TV but might not necessarily translate as much on some of the other mediums? I think one of the things that we've been spending a lot of time recently talking to folks about, and it's, it's somewhat of a delicate conversation, is for most talent, at least historically, your revenue generating opportunities really paralleled how well-known you were, how popular you were You're at curing, the point in time. Right? Yeah, like, score. Were you on TV? Then you can make more money for endorsements and other things as well. And they sort of followed each other in a bit of a, in a, bit of a bell curve. And we're seeing a lot more talent now. I do think understand the notion that in order to build for the future, you need to depart from that a little bit, right? You can't bank on the fact that you're going to maintain the same level of popularity over the entire entirety of your career, let alone your life, because that big show, that big film, whatever it may be, will go away. So we spend a lot of time, and I think what's come up a lot on, on this panel so far is, it really is about finding those endemic connections, and that's why the audience numbers are so important, because for the first time, instead of just being on a, you know, a, a TV advertisement where you know, the joke is 50% doesn't work, we just don't know which 50%. Now you know exactly what the audience looks like. And we can say to people, okay, you know, I'll take an example of a snowboarder, Sean White, like, here's what you stand for. Here's what your audience, why your audience cares about you. How do we now put you in a situation where you can continue to do that 10, 15, 20 years from now when you're not snowboarding anymore? And, and that for the right people, it's, it's, as I said, it's a delicate conversation because many yeah. people still are, you know, just show me the money, but more and more people are understanding that there's that opportunity to build for the long term and it's much more powerful for them than maximizing what you can do today. Um, so I guess it doesn't work as well for, uh, for uh, John Belushi as it does for Sean White, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's certainly a, a level of, uh, of talent that makes it significantly easier for sure. But a thousand Twitter followers not going to, you know, to break through in the way that, um, you know, that some of our clients uh, do. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for us to, when you have success with one person, then everybody else comes down and says, hey, can you build me a company? And you have to explain to them that that's not for you know, that's not for everyone. And in yeah. some cases, you know, as, as was described earlier, you have to go through that growth process to get to the stage, you know, where, where you are known in that way and can build off your uh, celebrity, credibility, et cetera. You think there's any lag effect uh, for brands or celebrities in terms of having, you know, being fully built out on social media? Um, like, for example, um, I represent Bob Vila, who's a home improvement expert. Um, and 
over the last four or five years, we've done incredible things with Bob Vila's numbers, such that his, he's just exponentially more popular on social media than, for example, Home Depot is. Um, and you would think of Home Depot as a giant name, but we just started to equate brand names and celebrity names as brand names and, and just see what their, what their rating is. And um, in the home improvement area, Home Depot, Lowe's, these companies aren't really paying attention to social media that much. Um, and so it, it just made me think that, you know, maybe in other areas, there are celebrities and brands who haven't really built their house yet. Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think absolutely. To me, it really just comes down to, can you identify what that person is about, right? And I think Bob Vila is a great example because as soon as you say Bob Vila, everybody knows what Bob Vila is about. And so it makes it that much easier to create resonance with the audience that also cares about that. Um, but oftentimes, and I think what's, what's changing a bit is we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of clients, a lot of celebrities that are really known for being celebrities. Right? They're known because they were in a movie or in a TV show and you gotta think like, oh well what is that person's connection? And they, they don't equate anymore in, in my mind, right? It's not just the, the sort of broad Q score and, and, you know, versus the potential for that person. Potential is more tied to, it's more nuanced as much, how much people care about them, how much people identify them with a specific area of passion. Um, and I think that's, that's becoming more the, the barometer now. I, I think we're still seeing with some clients, and you might know better than I do, uh, there's still some reluctance on the part of, 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 you know, above the title movie stars to embrace social media. Some of them, we're seeing that because they want to, their privacy is very important to them. They're not as comfortable with, you know, revealing what they did with their kids this weekend, et cetera. And I think we have some clients that are huge stars, household names, and they can still get away with it. They don't have to do social media for now. I don't know what that's going to look like or 10 or 15 years, but I would doubt that 15 years from now you're going to be able to play that because, as you said earlier, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a studio and I'm casting a movie, the person that's got 10 million followers on social media is going to be pretty appealing to me because they can help me sell movie tickets if they promote the movie through their channels. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we're still in transition. And by the way, no one has really, outside of music, I think, really figured out how to monetize social media. But it's still a place that you need to be if you're trying to build a long-term business. But there's a whole group of people. I mean, as YouTube has migrated from sort of, you know, 30-second videos of non-professionals, that business has built up quite considerably. You know, we represent, or we have, um, we don't represent, we have Michelle Fawn under a deal with Endemol Beyond, which is our recently launched MCN. And this is a woman who obviously, you know, started with something very small and has grown an empire. You know, her Ipsy business, which is, you know, that's a great example of translating, like, YouTube videos to a commerce platform. Ipsy, which is a product for a pro beauty and product discovery site, they do $200 million in revenue. Right? And she looks at someone from TV and says, why would I ever do TV? Like, you must be out of your mind. You got to go through a pilot, and then you're not talking to your viewers, and it's all this stuff. So there's this whole ecosystem that she has built that is way more powerful than probably most celebrities today, right? I mean, you know, so and commerce. What's it based on? She gets, rev she gets referral fees for things that people buy? Well, she's, it's her site, right? So just like, you know, you know, just like somebody, just like Jessica Biel started The Honest Company, right? Hers was, hey, I'm known for beauty and fashion product tips, so let's start a, you know, product discovery network. Um, you know, so it's a commerce site, basically, through her filter. You know, and it's wildly successful. Uh, we should all be so lucky, you know? So I, I think The Honest Company was a game changer. I mean, I really do. It, it, it's a seminal moment, and now that may be what you were referring to either. It, yes, Gal was a CA client, didn't she? You know, everybody wants that now, you know, but it, it, it's a rare opportunity. But the truth is she'll make more money with that company than she ever would as a successful actor. And, and how many other household name actors would have been willing to do that? You know, it, very few because they're afraid of what it might do to their you know, their brand strength, but she did it and she's a billionaire because of it and doesn't need to worry about it. How could it hurt her brand strength? 
It can't. I don't think it can. But I think there's a lot of talent in well, listen, Hollywood that is afraid of that. Every, Failure. Maybe if it fails. Everybody told Tyra Banks not to do a reality show 12, 15 years ago, right? It was like, oh, reality. It's you know, it's it's crazy. It's midgets. It's it's crazy stuff. Getting married on TV. <laughs> her, she fired her agency over it, mm. right? Um, and that led her to her talk show. So like. There's always this seminal shift, and the traditional people say, wait, wait, sit this one out. Someone jumps in, and, and look at what happens. But there's, the problem is, we only get up here and talk about the successes, right? It's, it's like any story. It's the one that made it through the system, but there's, for every one of those, there's probably dozens and dozens of celebrity pieces of talent that tried something and failed and then looked at you and go, I told you I shouldn't be doing that. What's wrong with you? That's how you get fired. Yes, yeah. right? <laughs> well, I, I, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, and I'm a little bit familiar with Jessica Alba and what she's trying to do. I, you know, I haven't personally tried any of the products or, or, or whatnot, but I will tell you if she's as successful as you say she is, and what I've read, she's probably really talented at identifying these products. She's mm -hmm. probably involved in quality control. She's probably hired the best people. It's not about the internet or yeah. digital or anything else. It's about, yeah, it got her, she's famous. She took hold of something that has a very democratic reach, but she's delivered a great product. And, and I go back when, when uh, I was uh, producing a show called Blowout about a, a hairstylist, and we launched uh, a Jonathan Product. The hairstylist was named Jonathan Anton. And it was like the first real product integration yeah. launch. I, you know, I, that, was, that, was, that was the dawn of it all. Yeah. And, and, and when I told Bravo, I said, look, I want to put him in business. And they said, oh, no, we don't want to do a business story. We just want to do celebrities' hair. And so after we got a second season pickup, between the first and second season, I got some private money and a company that was willing uh, to get into this business. And Bravo still didn't want to do it. And, in, and we sent in the, uh, uh, some of the, uh, you know, a cut on, on a first episode, and Jonathan took what he called dirt, and he threw it at the wall. And the two women who developed the, prod, pro, uh, the product were on the phone and said, how do you like it? Well, he threw it out the wall after he tested it out and said, this is too oily, I hate it. And he threw it out the wall, and it dripped down slowly, and I made him do it two or three more times, so it was very dramatic. We sent it to Bravo, and of course, they began to like this process. And then cut to, we premiered a show uh, with him being on QVC, you know, simultaneously to it also being available in about 100 doors in Sephora. And, and on QVC in, 60 min, uh, uh, in, in a 60-minute show, we sold $3 million of dirt at $22 per little thing. And we we're off to the races. And we didn't have a big social network. I remember he had a MySpace page at the time. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. What we did, we did have great partners. And Jonathan, with all his craziness, knew what good products were. We invested a lot of money in the products. They were very good. They were reviewed well in magazines, et cetera. And that's why you know, the product didn't endure for other reasons. But it'll launch you. But unless it's good, it's not going to uh, endure. So I love this. We've come up with a whole other platform in our panel, which is products and product sales. Because um, I've done a lot of QVC and HSN stuff too. And it's, it's actually, I think it's very difficult. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a 3D version of TV. Because you've got to, like you said, the product has to be good. The, there can't be like a, you know, a, a disaster that's they're using the wrong stuff and it's bad for the environment. You know, like all of these things are, are important because uh, it's touch. The customer is going to touch the product in the end. Um, but um, but you it's, see, it's, it's reverse just, engineered. It's so though. much. It's so, and it's also, you know, just an opportunity, another opportunity for producers. It's, it, there's, it's so much easier than when you did that. You know what I mean? Because you've got online sites and just the, just, honestly, just the efficiencies of scale that the internet provides make some, doing something like that a lot easier um, and make going direct to That's right. consumer just with any entertainment product easier. So, But there is a lot of noise out there. So yeah. with more buyers and more investors, there's more competition. So how do you differentiate yourself? And with the big social following like some of our artists have, you, you can get that initial head turn of 20 million people and hope to convert 1% and you have a big business. But to everybody's point, it has to be an amazing product. And you deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. So like with Justin Bieber, for example, 
Uh, we took a big check from Guthrie Ranker to do a proactive deal, but we decided not to take a big check from Elizabeth Arden and develop our own perfume line for women, for Bieber. People yeah. thought we were crazy. And it sold well over $100 million at retail, and then we ended up selling the company back to Elizabeth Arden uh, after the fact. And again, without Justin's social following, we would have had no shot at doing that. And we had very mean and lean marketing budgets, creative campaigns to activate the millions of followers and dangle some carrots and sticks. But it's, it's the wild, wild west out there. It's so much fun because we're pretty much writing the rules. And to, to your point, there's a lot of failures in between these success stories. Right. We've had 10 bombs, and we just yeah. know that you have to keep experimenting, keep innovating, keep disrupting, but take smart strategic shots, you know, when it makes sense. I think the best analogy I see is just venture capital, right? I mean, that's a, the model is, you know, 10,000 pitches, sort of a thousand maybes, a hundred yeses, which net out at like maybe if you're lucky, one Google or whatever, or one Elizabeth Arden deal. And I think that's what people don't see is it's a portfolio business, right? I mean, I can tell you the story about Michelle or Justin, he can say Justin Bieber, but there are, you know, if you're not in the portfolio of all, and you can't ride out the failures, it's very difficult. So, you know, that's why the business in the tech side, like YouTube is a great business because they don't care which YouTube star does well, right? They, they, any one of them, all of them, right? The MCN business is an aggregator, so it's the same thing. So I think that's the key is to find ways to sort of create a portfolio of things that you're trying because not every one is going to be where you want it to be. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole the MCN thing is fascinating to me. I'm, I'm, it's a head shaker to me why nobody tries to compete with uh, with YouTube on it, and everyone can say, "Oh, because it's Google." Like, well, well, Vimeo you know, I mean, competes. I mean, that's they have a, that they may not do what you, they may not be up to your standards of a thousand, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. they, but they, you know, but they they have the we're the professional YouTube, Never right? Yeah. You know, so so there are people trying to do that. Thanks well, for and that. There's I, even by the way, you never live it down. I, I, I don't mind any insults. It's not an insult. I'm building your brand. I'm every time it's a shout out, you're probably getting a new it's life. It's 1500 down. Yeah, it's, it's up. It's rising. I see it. I don't. I don't think it's. I would beg to differ on whether or not it's competitive. I think it's different. Like uh, we were working with a chef for a while and on a small scale. There's this great company called Tastemate. They're not worried about scaling to billions of views. They want to focus on people who want to learn how to cook, and that's that's all they care about. And that's kind of what happened in cable. That's why we've got so many challenges. You weren't worried about reaching a broadcast audience. Like, let's just reach these people. And that specialization, I think, gives those of us who represent talent great opportunity. Because I don't need to reach everybody to monetize. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that's fascinating to me. I'd love to hear you all talk more about the fragmentation of media, how you used to have this, you know, these big giant platforms, but only five people could be stars on them. Um, and now you've got uh, all of this fragmentation, which on, on the one hand is uh, very frightening for most people, the idea that, that we're all just going to be disconnected humans in a country where everything is micro, micro targeted. But on the other hand, it just creates a lot of opportunity, like you were saying. I'd, I'd love to hear more about because it sounds to me like that's what you're all thinking about how to do is to uh, how do I more specifically target and, and get a better better bang for my buck off of whatever the, the thing is. Well, I think the good news is that you know 15 years ago, it's sort of a dot com one. Um, I actually worked at Microsoft up in Redmond and uh, in Silicon Valley and. The cost of starting up whatever your website was, if you remember the venture money, was so exponentially high, right? Servers and, and storage and all that stuff. You know, people were burning through hundreds of millions of dollars on, uh, you know, chairs and servers. Today, the cost for getting in the game is, is everything's a la carte, right? You sign up Amazon Web Services and you can have a website built. So it's a lot cheaper. So the, the long tail, as they say, you know, is a lot easier to target because you don't need millions of people to be using it. You can be just with the aficionados who care about you, which is what's interesting about people who are trying to do over the top, right? It's, it's, speci it's specific niches of program like Glenn Beck or Sarah Palin or some religious figures. You know, some of these over the top networks only need 10,000 people to sign up at eight bucks a month to be running a profit, right? So it's a lot easier to build a business because you don't need millions and millions of people to, to sort of jump on it. How many people in the room spend more than an hour a day, or, or an hour a day at least, um, on watching computer 
uh, you know, over the top television, like Netflix. So I mean, but ask someone who's under thirty or twenty, and you'll see, you know, people in college. Every right? It's every hand. Yeah. 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 Like, like that's a very big number for a bunch of people who are sort of, you know, at the older age of the spectrum here who are established, right? That's a, that was 50% or more. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's huge. You wouldn't have gotten that five years ago. I mean, it's Netflix that did it. But you, don't, you also don't have to, right? There's other things you can do. So it's who, no one wants to spend money if they don't have to. But the value proposition is, is fantastic, you know, that you can get. And now, H, who would have ever thought three years ago that HBO, which makes all its money from cable partnerships, was willing to walk away from their biggest revenue source? And yet today, you can get it on its own, a la carte. So, so the question is: Is it is it is it harder for is it is it the same or easier or harder for? The question is: Do small players that don't have big platforms yet have any chance of getting into the talent partnerships with A, B, even C level content with startup shows? I mean, there are a lot of talent: Adam Carolla, Sarah Silverman. I think that everybody in the creator and in the talent space right now just wants to make things. So they're. No, I'm saying the talent themselves yeah. want to make things. So the, the A and B list actors and writers and directors that you're talking about, they don't want to go through traditional development cycles with pilots for linear television, even though that business isn't going anywhere anytime soon. With that said, to, to your exact question, if you were to walk off the street and try to get an A-list actor, you're going to have to still come up with a very compelling package for why that's worth their time. It might be a passion project where they're taking a guild minimum. If you have a great, you know, guerrilla marketing strategy of just throwing it up on YouTube and hoping that, you know, somebody will come along and pay for it somewhere else in a premium landscape. And, and you have to sell it through their... Representation but the too. teams are still the teams. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a talent's going to be expensive or very picky no matter what platform it's on. So if you wanted to say you were going to put together a little independent movie and take it to Sundance, but you, know, you didn't have a brilliant script and no one knew your track record or you didn't have connections, it would be as difficult as you're sitting there doing a web series and saying, hey, it's the web, why can't I get these? It's the same equation. You know? it's, it has nothing to do with the... Uh, you know, with the platform at that time. I mean, what, what you have on the web is you can, the expectation for what people are, have been seeing, although now it's changing, is that you don't expect this very elaborate production. So somebody will step back and not see the famous actors, but catch something and appreciate it. Uh, because they don't have that expectation that they're watching a $4 million an hour show on Amazon or HBO or whatever. But what the, the, the establishment, establishment is invading the web now too and, and, and it's gonna, it's, the barriers of entry are going to go up 
uh, uh, you know, higher and higher all the time. I'm not, that doesn't make it a bad thing since you can always break through if something's great and doesn't cost you a lot, but that's just the nature of where we're going. I mean, I, I, I have recently made a deal for, people talk about incubation. Oh, you never, you know, the web things aren't really worthwhile, okay? Now we're starting to see things produced at the web for real budgets, but still it's hard. There's no money, why am I not, you know, trying to sell things to the web? But things that have been successful on the web, personalities, you know, you're seeing, you know, all over, you know, the, the cable world now. And you're going to see a proliferation of that. Is, and there, is there any bias on the part of representation if a package comes to an actor, a producer, director, whoever, to say, well, this is just a web project? If it's funny or die, I'm probably yeah. going to look at it very seriously. Best but if it's from somebody I don't know and it's not brilliant when I read it, I'm not going to pay attention to it. Yeah, and there's no, there's no <laughs> universal bias. You know, I mean, the only bias is, is it good and is it going to work? Can I try and help you with, with sort of this? Uh, my whole life I've been an independent producer, and although I, I, you know, I work with Endemol, I, I have my own company, so I, I still have to be out there and, and sort of like Rob, you know, find the talent and put it together. And I would say that the secret to being an independent producer in a, you know, a world that is consolidating is to find sort of what I like to call an arbitrage, right? So if you're looking for talent, um, you want to maybe look at talent that maybe is not getting certain roles. Like, you're known for comedy, but you'd always wanted to do something in drama. So I've got an interesting drama project. Now, their TV agent or their movie agent might not endorse that, but hey, this could be totally fun. You know, so if you find something that they've want, you know, because even though they're celebrities, they don't work 24 hours. They don't work, you know, every month, every day of the year, right? So you find something that they're passionate about, that they find creative and interesting. These people want to do interesting things, as we said before. And so if you can find the leverage where you're offering something that somebody else isn't, you're seeing them in a different light. You're connecting them with a different type of brand. That's the beauty of being the producer now, is that you've got these things that you can sort of put together to bring them along. You know, the thing I'd add to that is I think talent absolutely wants to do interesting things, as, as several people have mentioned, but they also want people to see those interesting things. Yeah. They don't want to do it in a vacuum, so sure. you need to come not only with an interesting project, but if it's a less known distribution platform, what is the plan to get it out there? How can you strike interesting partnerships? Because in the, so I, I don't think, as has been said in direct response to your question, that there is any institutional bias but the old world was somewhat simple in, in that a cable network would come in and say, I have 80 million subscribers and here's what our ratings look like and, and give people a sense that their show or whatever it might be, their piece of content would be watched. And looping back, I think that's why the social world is so important because that has been the equivalence at this point in time and how you get some sense of security that is actually going to get out there for the world to see. Right, and you know, we heard at the very beginning that you need the money, right? The product has to be good, but you do need the money or else you're only going to get half a quarter of the way or halfway there and then it's not going to work. Um, and we, we, you know, part of the panel is to talk about brand engagement too, right? So celebrity and brand engagement. And, you know, that might be the mix that gets you to Evan's, you know, over Evan's line where, okay, we, I have a good web thing and I've got some talent. The talent's sort of doubting it, but now I have Microsoft. Um, and, you know, as long as you get that mix together and get them, get it yeah. going, then I think it can work. Um, actually, you had a question back there? Our company's philosophy is that smartphone screen is the most important screen to be developing content for. So whether that's working very closely with a Spotify that has the best user experience and product on the phone right now, or it's working with some of these over-the-top players that are coming soon and investing heavily in the space, 
it's critically important because that's where it's going and that's what's going to hook up to the Apple TV so you can see it on your flat screen at home as well. Um, the examples that you cited are, are great ones that are innovative, disruptive, partnerships, um, which again are coming from new players, new buyers in the space. There was never a mobile gaming company that was going to cut a $5 million check to Kim Kardashian and give her a royalty against that check. That never happened before. Um, game, of, game of War for, for Kate, same, same situation. So as these new buyers um, are emerging, we take them very seriously. We try to get at the front of the line and present our clients you know, for the ones that make sense on the partnership front. But it's the most important screen, and it's only going to get more important. I would add to that, too, that I, I, I think it's important to remember that I don't think consumers care about a distribution channel. They couldn't care less what channel delivers their content. They don't care what movie studio generally releases the film. They don't care where they watch their content. They care what is the content. I am, if, if I'm a fan of my favorite music artist, then, then I'm indifferent to the format. Do I care if it's a CD or if it's stream? No, I just want that content. So, uh, you know, with young people, as you said earlier, millennials who are cutting cords and using their... My son, I thought I was a great parent because my son never watches TV. And then I'm like, wait a minute, how many hours is he spending with his iPad in his hand? You know, he's watch, watching Hulu all day long. So I don't think that the platform is relevant to consumers. They, they care about the content. And, and mobile is clearly the direction that it, it's that hard to do for it's hard to, to do good content for mobile it's it's a challenge because it's small and it has to engage uh, in a different it has to engage with the outside world it's our, it's the first example of augmented reality in the palm of your hand really um, and you know, I've been working on mobile content stuff since the 90s and it's it's been really interesting to watch um, and I think uh, just VR is going to the the analogies between what works on mobile and VR are, are so direct, it's unbelievable. Like you could actually just look at how mobile developed from 99 until now, and you can see the path for VR. I think one of the, the, you know, again, I think one of the great things about mobile is because you have it with you all the time, and particularly amongst young people, it's really geared towards commerce, right? I, I think what I'd love to see is um, content that is not just driving revenue from advertising, or brand integration, but like actually trying to generate transactional. Because there you are used to buying, you know, the, I don't know, checking it for eBay or whatever you might do on it. But if there was a way to sort of think about Rob's example with, you know, the, the um, Jonathan Anton TV show on Bravo, but there was a YouTube version of that, um, you know, I think it's, it's made for that, you know, especially with your wallet being all in one place, it makes it much, much better than you ever could do anything like that on TV. I think there's a huge growth opportunity there. Yeah, I think the Starbucks app is better than Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> So that is a fascinating question. How, how is the, the sort of growth of the power of talent to control their own platforms, their own shows, and have equity ownership affecting the relationship between talents and agencies and how agencies are getting them gigs and, and representing them? I would say by that, on the way, we're biased on that issue, but I think that's a short-term win and a long-term loss. It, it, representation 
really hates it when you go direct to the talent, right? I mean, that's what we're here for, and, and part of the reason that we say no from time to time is that we vet all the opportunities that come through. So it's, I know that wasn't your question, but it is something that happens an awful lot. These people are available directly on Twitter, most of them. And uh, and they get hit up all the time. Uh, that that's just frustrating for me. Yeah, I we know. I mean we take a a long term approach as well and vision like so CAA for example is the agency that represents half a dozen or a dozen of our acts, and if there's a television property that comes straight to us, sure we could call our friends and lawyers and paper up the deal, but they're the experts in the space. They know what the five deals before that look like, they knew they know what the five alternatives look like. And so we work together as a team, but oftentimes like our talent do ask us, they say, why, why are there so many middlemen? Why is this person taking a percentage and that person taking a percentage? And it's our job to explain to them on a case by case basis why whatever the splits are are fair. And sometimes agents don't get a cut and they understand that and we talk to them about that. And other times they get cuts on things that they don't touch and we completely handle. And it's an investment in that partnership and making sure that they're going to bring us the next five deals and not the guy down the street. Yeah, and I think to, to echo that, it's really about the agencies continuing to prove what their value is and whether that be expertise in the traditional uh, sort of content formats and market knowledge uh, or being out there to understand what the next opportunity is and be sourcing those actively on behalf of clients. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think any, anybody in the talent representation business will say, you know, we just sit back and wait for, you know, wait for our client's team to, you know, to call us. We want to be out ahead of that. Uh, but a specific example as it relates to these guys, you know, our biggest engagement with them is on uh, tour booking. So their clients having a bigger social presence is the greatest thing in the world because it means more people wanting to buy tickets to the tours, uh, you know, where we have a proven value and set of relationships that, they don't, they don't want to replicate. So, you know, I think it depends on understanding where the value is and, and aligning uh, and finding those situations where the more, you know, Justin Bieber and Ariana Grande do on Twitter and the bigger their fan base is, like, that's good for everybody. I, I think social is much more of a new version of PR than it, right now anyway. I mean, we, we try to encourage our clients to tell their brand story through social media. You know, if, if you love to cook and no one knows that, well then tell people on social media that you love to cook and talk about cooking. Um, it's, it's, it, for content, the content that they're producing is a term that I think gets used a little bit loosely. It's not the kind of high production value, quality, monetizable content that a lot of the people on this panel work in. It, if someone produces a piece of social content, it's really more storytelling for now. I, I'm curious, not to change the subject, but w I, I think Periscope is pretty interesting. I don't know what you guys think about it, but it's just one of these things that newly, like one day I hadn't heard of it, and the next day I heard 20 people talking about it. Um, any of your clients on Periscope? We, we have a few, so we're being... Uh, Describe what Periscope is. So, if you yeah, so Periscope is a company that was acquired pre-launch for $100 million by Twitter. So it wasn't even out yet, but Twitter knew that they wanted to be in the space of live video streaming. So on Periscope, you sign up, it pulls in your Twitter friends, and then you fire up a front-facing camera on your phone, and you're live. And people all over the world can see you and tune in while you're cooking mac and cheese or talking about politics or you're on the front lines of riots in Baltimore. It's an area that a hundred companies have tried to crack. And I think it's so interesting, and it's going to work, and it's probably already won. Like Meerkat had a moment. They raised a lot of money. Their numbers slid basically immediately. They've got Twitter's muscle behind them, and that is why Periscope is so interesting. Um, and it's working. I mean, I watched, I watched four hipsters, like, make a pizza in Brooklyn the other day and was just asking them about their tomato sauce and it was stupid but it was like a fun like interaction and I think it's I think it's going to get more and more interesting and it's they they have the push notifications so you hear this little birdie tweet sound and you you look on your phone and it's 
you know, a celebrity that's, you know, doing an acoustic show from their tour bus, or it's you talking about whatever you're talking about. So it's, it's really interesting. It's real time. It's fun. It's engaging. You can comment on the video so they're answering questions in real time. No, it's a standalone. I feel like I'm a spokesman right now for Periscope. It's a, you can download it in the App Store. Uh, iOS only for now. Yeah. With with songs. with a comment uh, <laughs> function. Yes. Check. Yes. 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 Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. So it's brand new. They had to race to market because there were a few other players that were getting traction, um, and so they pushed it, and and they're winning. They're doing a great job. So. Uh, Believe it or not, that's it. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>